So, this is a story about the underground tunnels in my town that me and my friends used to visit when we were kids. We'd heard stories about these tunnels, so we wanted to check them out for ourselves. So when we were kids, we began visiting these old underground tunnels that were built during World War I for the military. The tunnels were small and only one person could go in a line and you couldn't go by someone's side because there was just no light and it was too tight so and we needed to carry our own flashlights and walk very carefully. It was really hard to coordinate inside these tunnels as well so we used to carry chalk so that we could mark the direction that we were coming from and didn't get lost. The first two to three times that we went there everything was pretty good. But we never went deep inside the tunnels, only like maybe a hundred meters or so. One day we wanted to go deeper inside, so we made a plan and we went inside. My friend Mark was first in line and then my other friend Alexander and then me and the rest of the gang behind me. The guy that was last in the line was marking our path and making sure that we didn't get lost. But soon enough, we did get lost. We started panicking and we were inside the tunnels for three hours and the strange thing is that it seemed like someone was erasing our marks on the wall. We needed an escape plan so we just continued walking in the direction that we thought was the way we came in. And after about 15 minutes of walking I noticed the most disgusting smell that I've ever experienced in my life and I didn't notice it when we went in so I knew that we were going in the wrong direction. I told my friend Mark that this seemed strange and that we needed to turn back around and go back the way we came. He hesitated but eventually agreed with me so we went back. And then we started hearing noises and we were pretty scared at this point and everybody was hearing scratches on the wall and footsteps. But one of our friends said that he saw someone behind us but I think he was just paranoid and that his mind was just playing tricks on him. Eventually we came to the part of the tunnels that we were familiar with but we couldn't find any of our marks. About one and a half more hours in the tunnels and we finally found the exit and went out. Now that next week I was with my parents in our living room watching news on the TV when I heard that the local cemetery sunk in the ground because of some of the underground tunnels breaking. And then it hit me. The smell that I'd noticed while we were down there was because we were under the cemetery. I still can't really explain how our marks managed to disappear from the walls, but I can assure you that there was no one in the tunnels except us. And after that experience, I started to believe in all the stories that I'd heard about the tunnels, and I swore that I would never go near those tunnels ever again. My fiancé and I threw a dinner party one time to celebrate his mum completing chemo. I hired a caterer, but we were expecting 25 friends and family, so it was more than the kitchenette of our single-story ranch house could handle. We'd also only just moved in, so didn't have a lot of cooking staples. The caterer said that he'd bring everything, 75% done, but he needed to finish off some dishes in our kitchen. I told him that that was fine as long as he was finished by five because the kitchen is centrally located and we'd prefer everyone be finished before the guests arrive due to the intimate nature of the occasion and all that. And he said that that would be fine. So he arrives as scheduled at 12pm, we gave him until five and the guests aren't even arriving until six so it's plenty of time. And he smelled like actual dog crap. But his accent sounded European, so I thought that maybe he just didn't believe in deodorant or something. It was more than a sweat smell, though. It smelled like a, a sunbaked diaper, if I'm being honest, and that made me uneasy because he was going to be preparing food for the sick and young children. But I just made sure that he washed his hands, and then I left him to his own devices, worrying that I was just being presumptuous. Throughout the entire process, he keeps pulling me aside to ask me questions, though, and have me taste things and whatnot. I was super busy because my husband had to work during the day and pick up the surprise guests right after, so setting up the deck, decorating, putting together the slideshow equipment, coordinating the surprise guest. We flew in her sister, and I had to make sure that she got an Uber at the airport and her hotel had worked out and all that. And just a, a million other little details. 
So every 10 minutes being asked things like, do you prefer this with paprika or without? With this is fine, whatever you think. Tasted to be sure was getting old pretty fast. When he was still there at 5.45 after two gentle reminders, I flat out told him that I needed him completely out by 6 no matter what. He apologized and said that there had been a delay because our oven wouldn't stay up to temperature. I'd never had a problem with our oven, but I figured he's the professional. Maybe it was a subtle problem that I'd never noticed. A little before six rolls around, a few of our friends start trickling in. I decided to tell him that whatever is done is done, and whatever isn't, that he should just put it in the fridge. But he's nowhere to be found. I go out on the deck to ask my friends if they'd seen him, and... He's out there, alcohol beverage in hand, out of his chef whites, and now in a tea and jeans, just mingling with my friends. I walked out just in time for him to introduce himself to my cousin-in-law as a, a good friend of mine. And no, that was too weird for me. I met him in person for the first time just barely six hours ago, and I told him then that he needed to leave. And now... He goes inside and gets his bag and makes a beeline for my bedroom. I'm taken aback and I say, excuse me, where are you going? And he says to change. So, first of all, we have a guest bathroom clearly visible. Second, why can't he wear a t-shirt and jeans home? I tell him that I'm not comfortable with him going into my room, but he insists that it'll only be a second and goes in and shuts and locks the door. I couldn't even get a word out before he went in and I just felt helpless. I was going outside to ask one of my friends to help me usher him out but at that point my fiance got there with my aunt-in-law. I had to explain the situation to him nearly in tears at that point and he was like what he went into your bedroom why? So he pounded on the door and the caterer came out still in a t-shirt and jeans and my fiance said you shouldn't be in there you need to leave. And the caterer said, excuse me, but this is not your house. It's not up to you to decide. And my 6'4", 260 pound fiance tells him, yes, actually, it is his house. And puts a hand on his back and guides him to the door. The caterer says, I thought that she lived here. And he says, yes, my fiance lives here with me. And the caterer goes nuts. He turns to me and screams, you lied to me. I have no clue what he's talking about, but he starts yelling about how I let him on and starts calling me every name under the sun, and I don't know who he thought that the man in the pictures with me around the house was, but my fiancé says, Oh no, you won't talk that way in this house. Find the door, now. And the caterer goes into the kitchen and starts throwing the trays of food out of the refrigerator and on the floor. At that point, my fiancé realised that two of his brothers, both currently offensive linemen at the college level, had come in and were on the deck. He signalled them and they came inside and he basically said that this guy is harassing my woman. Since they're a family of all boys and my fiancé is the first to get married, they don't get to flex their protective muscles too often and they jumped at the chance to toss this guy out. And then, the party went on as planned. But... I insisted we just ordered pizza and throw out all the food that he made, just in case, you know. My fiancé and friends kept saying, isn't that a bit much, but I was insistent. But we went out late drinking with his brothers and got home at around 3.30am and I passed out in our room. Now, at around 5am, I was woken up to the sound of the door opening. I figured that either he forgot to lock the door in our drunken stupor and it blew open or one of his family forgot their keys or something in the house and didn't want to wake us up. His parents and his local brother have a key. But his parents never, ever, and I mean ever, let themselves in when they know that we're home. And his brother had had even more than we did and was definitely not awake and driving around at 5am. It wasn't nearly windy enough for the door to have blown open too. It had been tranquil all night. So I wake up my fiancé and whisper, someone just came in the house. And he said the same thing. Probably my brother left his wallet or something. I figured that I was just being paranoid and I tried to put it to rest when I hear a loud crash sound. And with that, my fiancé was up and on his feet in one movement. He told me to lock myself in the closet and call 911 while he went and looked around. As I was pulling out my phone, we hear in that distinct accent, 
hello, and I realize that it's just this insane caterer. I'm not worried about this caterer physically overpowering my fiancé, or even me for that matter, so I just charge right out there. The caterer is shirtless and clearly on something, and he's taking the pictures that are just of me off the wall and holding several in his arms already. He lunges towards me when he sees me, and my fiancé gets between me and him, and I call 911. My fiancé tells him that the cops have been called and it's in his best interest to get off the property. Caterer says, no, I have to make sure that she is okay. And I say, what? Why wouldn't I be okay? And my fiancé rightfully says not to engage with him and feed into it. My fiancé stays between me and him while I climb out a window. He watches as the caterer throws photos of us on the floor. Fiancé didn't want to subdue or touch him in any way, so Caterer couldn't make an assault claim, and he's begun to destroy our kitchen at this point, and when the cops come in, he has a butcher knife. Now, my fiancé considered going for the gun safe when he first got the knife, since we live in a stand-your-ground state, but he decided the situation was hectic enough without introducing a firearm. Caterer doesn't obey the police, orders to drop his weapon, and he says that he isn't leaving without me, so they tase him. It's honestly lucky for him that he only got tased and he didn't antagonize my husband into just squashing him. As he's let out in cuffs, he's shouting how he and I are in love and it figures how I, I chose a macho thug over a sweet sensitive artist like him and all women are whores and just etc, etc. He continues on this tirade the entire time the police are reading him his rights as well. The police ask us to do an inventory of the house and see if anything's missing or damaged besides what we witnessed him do, and we go around and there's nothing. But then I remember that he was in our room yesterday and I go through the room, and all my panties from the dirty laundry hamper, they were gone, and some toys were gone if you catch my drift too. We were so freaked out in the aftermath that we replaced all of our kitchenware, toothbrushes, and sent our sheets to be professionally cleaned, and had a cleaning crew do a clean on the whole house. And honestly, I'm so glad that we decided not to serve the food to our guests and my fiancé's medically fragile mother. He also sent me a letter from prison that, thankfully, my husband intercepted because I was still recovering from the whole thing, and... We gave it to the police who helped us to get issued a, a no contact order. And he was sentenced to three years in prison five years ago. So he's out by now, but thankfully we haven't seen him. I visited my boyfriend's house for the first time recently and it looked like a, an older double wide trailer, two bedroom in Southern California. As we laid down for the evening I noticed the closet was wide open and I just felt a, a chill and just really bad energy from that closet. The bed was close by as I asked him to close the closet ASAP and at my request my boyfriend froze and became tense. And really seriously, he looks at me and says, if I close the closet, they'll get mad. I ask, who will get mad? Feeling really confused and creeped out by his reaction. He looks down and looks lost as he answers and says, I don't know, weird things happen when I close the closet, we have to leave it open. So I begin to think that he's just full of it and just being an ass and trying to scare me. I try to get him to stop joking and admit that he's lying, but he stays super serious and I even start to believe that he's crazy for mentioning that we can't close the closet because someone invisible will get mad. I try to argue and insist, but he ends up just acting dismissive and insists on keeping the closet open. So, after an hour, we both settle down and my boyfriend falls asleep. The light is off and I stare into the void of the open closet and feel really on edge. Now that he had said that something would get mad if I closed the closet, I felt like something was watching me, but I must admit that it felt real. I get up and I close the closet nearly all the way, but I don't shut it, and after that I was able to somehow fall into a peaceful sleep. Suddenly though, around 2am to 3am, I'm startled from a peaceful sleep to hear whispering. It felt like I'd heard the whispers in my dream at first, Maybe sleep paralysis? 
I'm not too sure, but I felt bombarded as if uh, a lot of energy or voices are reaching out to me. It sounded like two to four different male voices are speaking from within the closet in a, a strange kind of flowing language. They are talking loudly as if they want to wake us up, and the voices are, are kind of raspy. I fully wake up after realizing that I can definitely hear something from the closet, and at that point, the voices stop as soon as I wake up, but I can feel something watching me. I knew at this point that it wasn't a dream as well, and my boyfriend is sound asleep next to me as I sit up and I stare into the darkness of the room. And the closet is all the way open, even though it was definitely nearly closed before. I remember closing it. At this point, I began to have panic attacks as I tried to lay silent and go back to sleep, but then I, I felt like there was something in the room with us. I got up and I went to play the Game Boy in the kitchen in the other room because I was just too scared to stay there. 30 minutes later, my boyfriend gets up and finds me in the kitchen. I admit to him that whatever that was, it was mad that I closed the closet and that he wasn't crazy. And he later told me that when he closed the closets, he would begin to hear scratches against the wood of the door or even banging. So, I met this sick and twisted man online when I was 18 and ended up dating him. He was jealous, controlling, vindictive, abusive in every possible way and was filled with sadistic tendencies and rage. So, I tried to leave Oscar many, many times. I wasn't happy. In fact, I was in a constant state of panic and was absolutely miserable in the relationship that had lasted just a year. Each attempt to leave him was met with threats to hurt me and my family, with physically dragging me back, sexually assaulting and purposely trying to impregnate me, threatening to end his life or constant stalking and harassment until I just surrendered. But finally, I'd had enough and I decided I wasn't going to go back no matter what he did. He called my job non-stop and got me in major trouble and did the same at my house prompting me to unplug the phone line. He texted me to say that he promised that he was going to end himself if I didn't go back to him and instead of caving in I called his mum at work and told her. She got a hold of him and said that I must have misunderstood because he was clearly fine. I felt that I'd done all I could and I told him that I'd call the police next time he said something like that to have them go check on him. The next day I got a call on myself from Oscar and I rejected it. He called again and I rejected it again and then I heard the loud exhaust on his car outside while I looked down at my phone and saw him calling again. I let it go to voicemail while I peeked through the blinds to check if I had truly heard his car and as I'd started to falsely hear it sometimes out of just paranoia. But this time, he was indeed out the front of my house. My phone started ringing again and wanting him to stop, I answered it and he told me to come outside. I said, I don't want to see you. And he said, just come outside for a few minutes please, making a huge effort to sound pleasant. I asked, I told you to stop calling me and show up at my house, why can't you respect my wishes? Knowing that the question wouldn't be addressed. He said, I just felt bad about how everything went down and wanted to give you something that I made for you before you broke up with me. Just come out for a few minutes so I can apologize and then I'll go away and you'll never hear from me again. I don't know about this, I don't trust you, I told him, looking at him sitting in his car through the living room window. I promise, he said, kind of convincingly. I drove all the way here to give you what I made and I just have a proper goodbye. In hindsight, I should have called BS on all of that immediately, but I was young and still way too controlled by my need to not hurt other people's feelings. I felt bad that he'd driven the 40 minutes to my house with something that he'd made for me, for me to just refuse to come out. So I stated firmly, fine, but only for a few minutes. And you promise that you're not going to try and beg for me back. He promised and I went outside and I opened the passenger side door and sat down in the seat, leaving the door wide open. He commented that I must think that he's going to kidnap me, trying to pass it all off like a joke and I told him that I just wanted the leg room. He had a bouquet of flowers and some cases of DVDs that he'd burned for me all for the seasons of my favourite TV shows. But we talked for a minute when my cell phone rang and... 
I shouldn't have picked it up, knowing that it was a guy from my job, but I was an idiot. I answered it, and I talked to the guy for less than 30 seconds, and Oscar could hear that it was a man's voice. And I could instantly tell when I saw his head snap to attention in my peripheral vision. And when I hung up, Oscar looked at me with fury in his eyes and asked me some questions about the caller that I can't even recall now. Before I could reply to whatever he asked, he had slammed on the accelerator and was now flying down the street with my door still open. I instinctively pulled my legs into the vehicle and started screaming for him to stop. He didn't even seem to be hearing me though and I tried to jump out when he slowed down at the intersections and seeing this he grabbed my clothes with his hand to hold me in and started making sharp left turns through the neighborhood to force my door to swing shut. Once that was accomplished, I tried to open the door again and he kept hitting the automatic locks to stop me and was consistently increasing his speed to ensure any leap from the car would be dangerous. And by now, it was dark outside. He was speeding through my town double the speed limit and I was hoping a police officer would see this and start tailing him and pull him over. But apparently, he'd gone unseen. He reached the freeway and I started really panicking and he would be able to go even faster here and fast track me to wherever he planned to take me. It took maybe only three minutes to get to the freeway at the speed that he was going, all of which I spent trying to get out of the vehicle. Once he was on the freeway, he was going over 100 miles per hour and I kept looking at the speedometer and it was dark outside and that much was too fast to jump from a moving car on the freeway, especially with other cars driving at high speeds and unable to see me. I still had my phone so I tried to dial 911 and I pressed the numbers with my hand, shoved down on the side of my seat by my window, away from Oscar, but he saw what I was doing and started swerving all over the road while trying to grab my phone. I still don't really know how he managed to get it away from me because every ounce of my being was trying to hold on to it. But he took it, rolled down his window, and threw it straight out. Rolling his window back up, he flatly stated, If I can't have you, then no one will. And that sentence made my heart sink. I felt like I was in a Lifetime movie and Oscar was possessed by his need to possess me and I was just trapped. And this was when the grim reality started to really set in. He was out of control and I was out of options. I started screaming for help and pounding on the windows, but Oscar had the tint on those windows so dark that I probably wouldn't have been seen, even if it wasn't dark outside. I watched as the people in each car we passed remained just blissfully unaware of the chaos going on in this car that I was kidnapped in and I was feeling very defeated but was running through all the possibilities of how this could go over and over in my mind, trying to figure out how to survive. I decided to stop fighting and just acted afraid because the only way I saw myself making it out of this was by feeding into Oscar's delusional state. I had no other weapons or means of escape at my disposal, so I decided on psychological warfare. Oscar had this friend named Yose that he gotten exceedingly close to over the course of our relationship, and after a time it was revealed to me in confidence that he had fled from Puerto Rico, supposedly on the run for murder. I saw Oscar was taking the necessary freeway interchanges to get to his place, and I knew that even if his friend hadn't really been wanted for murder, that he was the type of guy who would do anything for Oscar without moral restriction. He and I got along okay, but I knew he had no loyalty to me whatsoever. He was nice to me as long as I was an extension of Oscar, and so I had to act quickly. I proceeded to tell Oscar that I loved him and wished that we could be together, but I didn't see how it could ever work when things like what he was doing right now proved that he never cared about what I wanted. I hadn't necessarily cited that as a reason for wanting out of the relationship before, as it was much more complex than that, but I was hoping that it would be enough to offer him hope in this state of desperation. I told him that I'd been considering giving him another chance when I saw the flowers and the DVDs, but now that he was refusing to take me home when I asked him to, I was starting to second guess things. Oscar got off the freeway on Jose's exit and I started trying to formulate a plan for when the car stopped. I know that he had neighbors close by and decided I was going to run as fast as I could and scream at the top of my lungs. I was trying to keep Oscar's mind preoccupied in the meantime though so that he wouldn't think to call his friend and give him the heads up. They usually spoke to each other in Spanish so I would have no idea what was even said. 
Oscar told me that he did care about what I wanted and asked if he still had a chance with me if he turned around right now. And, in an effort not to expose myself with an overly enthusiastic reply, I hesitated a bit and said that I thought that we could probably work it out and that this would be a good place to start. And Oscar looped around and got back on the freeway, headed in the opposite direction, back toward my house. The rest of the ride was tense because Oscar was normally really perceptive and I didn't want to reveal myself and end up back on the line of fire. I can't recall what was said on the commute back, but I opted to talk about regular everyday things that I'd normally say to him in casual conversation. When we got back to my house and he let me open my door and didn't stop me from leaving, I could finally breathe again. I got out, taking the flowers and the DVDs with me and waved to him before walking into my house. And I walked straight to the garbage bin and just threw it all straight in the trash and then collapsed on my couch, shaking violently, but ultimately really grateful to have just made it home. The next day I went to the police station and I filed a restraining order against him. And within a few years, he would be jailed for other appalling crimes and sentenced to 60 years. Until I found that out, I, I never truly felt safe, but he is definitely where he belongs.